I am your shield. I am your sword. Point number one, wow, they really speed through the whole Master Chief is dead and Cortana has taken over his body thing from the end of season one by having Cortana say, Sever the connection. It's just that easy, huh? Point number two, I approve of the name of this operation considering my last name is Shepard. Point number three, I get Spartan 2s can run fast as hell, but wouldn't it be less tiring to use a Warthog or a Falcon to get from place to place? Point number four, I don't know why Kai refers to what she's seeing up at the relay station as a flicker when it's very obviously muzzle flashes from a gunfight. Point at number five, this captain saying he's allowed to use whatever force necessary to protect the villagers reminds me of K2SO in Rogue One. Congratulations. You are being rescued. Please do not resist. Point number six, and here we get to see Chief use the grapple hook from Halo Infinite in this show for the first time. Neil deGrasse Tyson's probably going to still have a problem with it though. I hope he keeps using it throughout the show and doesn't forget he has it, especially if he finds himself in a position where it would be a good idea to use it. Point number seven, just like I said in my breakdown of the fight as one trailer, I have zero idea why this elite just throws away his energy sword. Even going frame by frame, I just cannot figure out what made him let go of it. Point number eight, so throughout my breakdowns of the trailers for this season, I wasn't sure out of all the elites we saw, which was the Arbiter that had been confirmed to be introduced in this season though I was leaning more towards shots of an elite wearing silver ornate looking armour. Though it turns out the people who instead believed it was this elite that we got the clearest shot of from the Weenie Master Chief trailer might actually be correct. In an article from SFX Magazine issue 375, it was revealed Chief will be spared by the Arbiter in the first episode, and this elite, who John Letter goes on to say he recognised as being the leader, spares Chief's life. So, I'll take the L on guessing which elite was the Arbiter, but I will take the W that I guessed there would be stealth elites. It's just I said the Arbiter was the one who I thought was a stealth elite. If only I'd swapped them around, I would have had two Ws. Point number nine. Oh, so it was Perez who Chief was carrying on his shoulder in the trailers, and I was right that the people reflected in Chief's visor were these red-robed people, though I thought the mother here would have played a bigger role, considering she appears to be decked out with foreigner glyphs. Maybe she'll have somehow survived the glassing and come back in a later episode or something? I don't know. Point number 10, the mother tells Chief she's seen his death, and I'm just here thinking, oh great, Chief's going to die again? Is it going to be another fake out? Or was his death she saw the one from the end of season one and she's just a little late in telling him she saw it? Point at number 11, though there was some Halo style chanting in the original opening in season one, this time around we've got full on Halo music. It's like I'm in the main menu of a Halo game. Plus, rather than showing the useless AI part on the back of his head and then posing for the camera, this new opening now flies towards his eye as his visor is forming and then shows us the namesake of the franchise, an actual Halo ring. Neat. Point number 12, uh Oh, Chief's naked again, though this time we don't see his butt, so people are going to have to come up with something different to call him instead of Master Cheeks. Maybe Shower Chief? Point number 13, so season 2 seems to be going with the angle that during season 1, humanity and the Covenant were at war, but it wasn't a full-on extermination effort by the Covenant, like they'd fight if they ever bumped into each other, but the Covenant wasn't actively searching out human planets to glass. Point number 14, I'm sure everyone who hated the Quan Ha storyline in the first season screamed with delight when Keys revealed Magical had been glassed. So I hate to burst your bubble when I tell you, just because the planet's been glassed doesn't mean you can't return to it. In Shadows of Reach, the prequel novel to Halo Infinite, Blue Team actually returns to Reach to retrieve the Halsey clone brains from Castle Base, which she had frozen back when she made Cortana so that she can use them to create the weapon. And it was Reach where Aatrox returned to the galaxy from the Ark when banished forces led by Eshram and the Keepers of the One True Freedom led by Caster excavated a foreigner slit space portal which connected to the Ark. Also, don't forget in Season one, it was mentioned that beneath Magical there is some sort of foreigner portal, which many speculate might be how we end up getting to a Halo ring, and in the trailers and at the end of the Halo Declassified video for the first episode of this season, we see Halsey and Quan Ha walking down a very foreigner looking corridor which could take place on Madrigal. Point at number 15, Keys also mentions the planets Estuary and Fumarole and the 15th Silver Debrief titled Sanctuary on the Halo Waypoint website goes into more detail on this planet in the Core Connections section. Estuary made an appearance in Halo 2 Anniversary's Terminals, Terminal 3 only for particular justice, as one of the seven planets that was glassed by Thelfadami during his campaign against humanity as Supreme Commander of the Fleet of Particular Justice. Fumarole will no doubt be more familiar as it was the setting for the 
the still jaw-dropping Halo Reach live-action trailer deliver hope. Noble Team 40 in April 2552, with the objective of destroying a Covenant battlecruiser, Sanctity of Purification, by detonating a Fury tactical nuclear weapon from inside the ship. When Cat B320 is critically injured by a Banshee, Tom A293, the original Noble 6 on the team, takes the bomb and uses his jetpack to get it to the finish line, sacrificing himself in the process. Side note, I find it funny they describe Tom delivering the bomb to the Covenant ship as him getting it to the finish line, since Cat does run with it throughout the trailer as if it's an American football, or as a rugby ball, as us Brits would call it. Point number 16, sounds weird to me to hear people refer to Oni as the ONI. Does it sound weird to anyone else? Point at number 17, so the Halo Declassified video for the second episode of this season revealed the helmet Kessler wears isn't actually Soren's old helmet as I thought it was, but instead something Kessler made himself from a UNSC pilot's helmet, the lid of a toolbox, and some snowboarding goggles. Point at number 18, some heavy propagandizing going on with this sham ceremony for Talia, editing in a big ass statue, a lot more people, and a whole bunch of pelicans slash condors. Looks like they messed up a bit though, since all the ships on the right here have the same number, 325. Point number 19, watching the declassified videos and hearing people describe Ackerson as a manipulator, and then watching him in this episode and the next with how he interacts with everyone, he gives off serious little finger from Game of Thrones vibes, you know, before the show turned to crap. Point number 20, if Silver Timeline Parangoski had the same power, influence and secret knowledge that blue timeline Parangoski had, then her being made to take the fall for Halsey escaping and then becoming a, as she says, regular Joe, is the most impossible change the silver timeline has made from the blue timeline. Point at number 21, a bit of a nitpick, but did anyone else notice the inconsistency of the position of the torch, yes torch I'm British, in Soren's hand and whether it was on or not between cuts? Point at number 22, Soren, did you honestly not expect in the slightest that this could have been some sort of trap? Seriously? Point at number 23, is this show trying to gaslight us into thinking the new design for Cortana this season is meant to have always been her design? Since the visual parameters Chief has applied to this Blade Runner-esque virtual companion played by Jessica Chisnell looks closer to the Cortana design of this season than it does to the Cortana design of last season. I wonder what people think of the change in design for Cortana. In the first season, her face was CGI and she had a human skin colour, but now she's played by Christina Bennington and is completely blue just like in the games, except for when she's green or purple. Point at number 24, what is Quan Ha referring to when talking about this monster? I've seen most people suspecting it's the Flooding General or the Grave Mind or the Primordial from the Foreigner book trilogy specifically. Could this be something she's learned from whatever monitor is underground on Madrigal, you know, the one she saw in her Avatar The Last Urban Division quest in episode 7 of the first season? Or could this just be something as simple as she's just talking about death? considering Kester's come running to her upset after his dad didn't return and she asks him if he believes her now. Point at number 25, why didn't the writers have Halzer receive a chess set instead of backgammon? You know, considering chess is a kind of significant part of her life and Cortana's by extension. When the game is over, the king and the pawn go back into the same box. Were the first words spoken by both timeline Cortanas, though blue timeline Cortana said it in Italian. And this comes from Halsey's mother who said this to Halsey after their first ever game of chess together, the first and last time Halsey's mother ever won. Point number 26, so on this status board thing, we see listed the teams Cobalt, Gold, Omega, Silver, Sigma, Jade, Black, Grey and Green. The 16th Silver Debrief titled Sword on the Halo Waypoint website goes into the teams Black and Omega. Black team composed of Margaret 053, Romo 143, Otto 031 and Victor 101 made their debut in the Halo Evolutions anthology novel specifically in the story Blunt Instruments, where they were sent to take out a station that would prevent Helium-3 from being supplied to the Covenant ships blockading the Colony tribute. They were also the primary focus of the comic series Halo Bloodline, and later appeared in Halo Escalation's The Next 72 Hours arc, where they met their end at the hands of the foreigner commander known as the Didact. Omega Team, composed of August 099, Leon 011, and Robert 025, was first introduced to us in the beloved announcement teaser for Halo Wars back in 2006, where a group of Spartans appear at the end with the line, This is Spartan Group Omega. If they want war, we'll give them war. Omega will go on to appear briefly during the campaign of Halo Wars, when the UNSC Spirit of Fire helps evacuate civilians on the colony world of Arcadia, and they were also hero units that could be deployed in Halo Wars 2's multiplayer. Most recently, Omega Team appeared in our latest Waypoint Chronicle, Halo Hippocratica. Cobalt Team is listed on the board. I can't make out their names, but I have found a post on the r slash halo subreddit from the user dillpickle6194 
who lists the fourth member of Cobalt Team as Lee008. I also can't make out the names of Gold Team, but they appear to have six members. In the blue timeline, Gold Team first appeared in the novel Silent Storm, and during Operation Silent Storm, had four members, Joshua029, Daisy023, Naomi010, and Grace093. And again, Dill Pickles 6194s post list the members of Gold Team in the Silver Timeline as Nora 75 Nicholas 64 Oliver113, Claude148, Peter133, and Ruth147. If accurate, all the names and almost all the service numbers are exclusive to the show. Nora 075, however, shares the same number as Cassandra 075, who first appeared in the Halo 2 Limited Collector's Edition booklet, Conversations from the Universe. And also speaking of Nora, in the third episode of the first season emergence, Chief mentions having lost Nora 098 on the planet Mamor. If Dillpickle6194 is correct, that one of the names on the board is Nora075, that even means there were two Noras quote unquote conscripted into the Spartan 2 program, or that the people making this show messed up. The members of Sigma Team, Jacob027, Charles124, and Alma005, are exclusive to the Silver Timeline, though Alma does share the same service number as James005, who first appeared in the novel The Fall of Reach. Isaac039 and Vin030 exist in the Blue Timeline, and both made their first appearance in the novel First Strike, with Vin also going on to appear in the comic book adaptation of the novel The Fall of Reach. Going back to Alma005 and James005, we actually see sleeping next to John at the beginning of the second episode of the first season Unbound, Spartan 005. However, this Spartan appears to be male, and Alma is typically a female name. Think of Alma Wade from the Fear Games. Was this guy meant to be James 005, or has Alma become a gender-neutral name in the 26th century, or did the people making this show, just like with Nora, mess up? Jade Team is exclusive to the Silver Timeline, but its members, Joshua029 and Malcolm059, are not. Joshua made his first appearance in the novel The Fall of Reach, and Malcolm first appeared in the novel First Strike. Both appeared in the novel Silent Storm, where Joshua was the leader of Gold Team, and Malcolm was a member of Green Team. Grey Team, composed of Jai006, Adriana111, and Michael120, though the board in the TV show lists him as Mike, first appeared in the Blue Timeline in the novel The Cold Protocol. The novel, which seems to have heavily influenced the writers of the first season of this show, since Magical and the Rubble first appeared in it, and introduced the character of Reth though in the novel he's a jackal, not a human. One member of Green Team I haven't been able to figure out, and neither has Dill Pickles 6194 it seems, since their name when it's been on screen has either been out of focus or blocked. The other member, however, Anton044, is from the Blue Timeline as part of Green Team during Operation Silent Storm, and first appeared in the novel First Strike, and then also went on to appear in the novel Silent Storm. In the Blue Timeline, the other known members of Green Team were Kurt051, Solomon069, nice. and Malcolm059. Since Malcolm has already been shown to be a part of Jade Team in this show, this mystery second member of Green Team is either Kurt, or Solomon, or someone new. Point number 27, before we move away from the board, did anyone else notice that in the first episode, the layout of the board on the left is laid out correctly, with the names of the teams, then the members, and so on? But then, in this episode, when the guy is changing stuff around, the layout has been changed, with the members listed first, and then the names of the teams. I can only assume this has been done so that the name of Cobalt Team would be in frame with this guy changing their status without it being a wider shot of it in all the board. Point number 28, just like in Casino Royale and Die Hard 4, my favourite kind of henchman is a parkouring henchman. Point number 29, I can understand Sorin buying Quan Ha when she escaped Madrigal being glassed and arrived back on the rubble, but did he seriously have her tagged as well? He didn't stop that from happening or at the very least free her after and had it removed? Sorin really is a very bad man. This season's really making him into more of an asshole. Point number 30, I called it. Throughout his appearances in the trailers, I kept wondering if Lewis 036 here might be his Spartan, and I got it right. Then again, I did throw a pretty wide net, also wondering if he might just be Riz's friend, or boyfriend, or family member. Whatever, I'm still taking the W. Point number 31, I'm sorry, but these jumps Riz is doing makes me think of Hulk jumping in the 2003 Hulk movie. You know, the bad one. Point number 32, something that stood out to me is that in the Fighters 1 trailer, these shots of Chief and Kai has Chief saying, 
I know this enemy. It's here. I saw it. But in this episode, he doesn't say that at all. Instead, he says, Something you want to say? Point number 33, Akerson's conversation with Kai about not Master Chief, but John the Man, shows season two is making it very clear early on that all along, the biggest part of Master Chief's story in this show is the contrast between Master Chief, the emotionless killing machine, and John, the emotional human man. In the SFX magazine article I mentioned previously, Pablo Schreiber said, People who don't feel the helmet was necessary to come off, they're at such an early conception of what the show could be. In order to examine the discrepancy between these two versions of the character, you can't tell that story without taking the helmet off. If you don't agree with the helmet coming off in the show, you don't like our show, so there's no point discussing it. It would be like if people got upset when the Hulk would change back into Bruce Banner, saying the rage-filled Smashing Machine Hulk is the character everyone loves, so he should just never change back into the boring normal human Bruce Banner. No one cares about the conflict between these two personalities and how they could ever coexist with each other, we just want Big Green Man to go smashy smashy. Point number 34, so it appears the show hasn't completely abandoned the the mysticism that was introduced in the first season with the desert people Quan Ha goes to who have a go on a vision quest, as it appears this guy helps Riz with her pain just by touching her, like he's absorbing and removing her pain somehow. Point number 35, we get another instance of Talia tapping out a double beat, something we also saw her doing in the trailers. This could either be a PTSD response to what happened to her on Sanctuary, or it could be related to what she later tells John she heard in the interference. Point number 36, I like to think Spartan Attack is a twin stick shooter game similar to Spartan Assault and Spartan Strike. Point number 37, with no regular civilians recognizing John, and Akerson previously saying when it comes down to it, Master Chief is just a guy in a suit, the actual faces of the Spartans have presumably never been pushed in propaganda, only them suited up in their Majolna armor. The regular people of the show's world are just like the people of our IRL world. They only know Master Chief by his armor because his face has never been revealed to the wider population. Point at number 38. Okay, so all the women played by Bronte Carmichael, who fans of Star Wars will recognize as having played Leda Mothma in the TV series Andor, were clones. I'm going to assume human cloning hasn't recently become legal. Akerson's probably just been having the girl cloned in secrets. It is interesting as well that the clones only ever die when Halsey questions them about Akerson. Either it's some sort of built-in genetic kill switch, or Hals has been only been able to question the girls about Akerson when they were already close to death. Point number 39, when Akerson said he wanted to introduce Halsey to someone, I thought he was going to reveal Soren, since in the Fighters 1 trailer, we see what appears to be Halsey and Soren coming face to face with each other in this very same room. Also, because of those shots from the trailer, I believe it was most likely Akerson who laid the trap for Soren to capture him. Point number 40, so this explains why Cortana was confined inside of a glass box in the shots we saw of her in the Weedy Master Chief trailer. It most likely confines her from appearing outside of it like she was able to do in season one. Point number 41, my best guess is that Akerson had tasked Cortana with simulating the possibility of the Covenant invading Reach. Either that or something more personal for him, maybe his own death, considering Cortana says he won't be able to see her again based on her simulations, or the death of the old man sat on a bed we've seen in some of the season 2 trailers and who we see Akerson talking to in this picture from Akerson's actor Joseph Morgan's Instagram. Point number 42, Meridian name drop. Halo fans will know of Meridian from Halo 5 Guardians, you know, the bad one, the place where Cortana told Blue Team to go so they could enter a Guardian so she could bring them to Genesis, with Osiris team trying and failing to stop them along the way. Point number 43, and a Visegrad name drop. Halo fans will know of Visegrad from Halo Reach, you know, the very good one, the place where Noble Team first encountered the Covenant on Reach, initiating the Winter Contingency Protocol. Point number 44, Chief saying to his team, The Covenant's on Reach. Is similar to when Carter A259 tells Colonel Holland, The Covenant are on Reach. At the end of the second Halo Reach mission, Winter Contingency. Point number 45, this Marine, played by Jack Nevels, must have been inspired by the Battle of Winterfell in Season 8 of Game of Thrones, since he sends his men into the darkness to die, just like how the Dothraki and others charged into the darkness to be slaughtered by whites. At least they had some form of light though. Where are these Marines' torches? Is this the original Doom 3, where you can only have a gun or a torch in your hand, not both? Someone get these Marines some duct tape. Point number 46, yep, McKee is in fact alive again. Chief seeing her on Sanctuary wasn't a hallucination. I wonder if they'll explain how she survived being shot at the end of season one, but considering how they fast-tracked through John being brought back to life at the start of this season, I doubt they will. Saying that though, it isn't impossible that she could have survived. People IRL have survived from much worse injuries, and who knows what kind of medical knowledge and tech the Covenant have in the Silver Timeline. Point number 47, my breakdown and review of the episodes may be done, but I also want to take a look at the preview of things to come this season from the end of the Halo Declassified video for episode one. Halsey and Cortana will meet again, and it appears Cortana is now stored on a device of some sort. 
though not a data chip that Master Chief could plug into the back of his helmet. We see a bare chested elite, most likely the Arbiter, so nudity isn't just exclusive to humans this season. We then have Cortana speaking what sounds like a covenant language, but I've got no idea what she's saying. We get a series of shots that we've already seen in several trailers and I've already spoken about in my breakdowns of them, but then we get some dialogue we haven't yet heard between Akerson and Keys. They're standing in a room with some covered dead bodies, which I think may be the corpses of Cobalt Team as there are four bodies. So this scene most likely takes place after Silver Team has discovered Cobalt Team dead at the Claws and Plasma of the Covenant at Visegrad, but before the actual invasion has begun. Soren says something here that I just cannot make out at all. Do any of you guys know what he's saying? We then see a suited up Kai stopping an unsuited John with an angry look on her face. Quan, Haran, Halsey walking down a foreigner looking corridor as I mentioned before. Our first look at Miranda for this season, and then John beating the crap out of a bunch of soldiers. Very interestingly, we then see that Talia Perez will be joining the ranks of Akerson Spartan 3s as we see her decked out in spy armor, and maybe one of the Spartan 3s joining a bunch of others, and possibly Kai, in flying through space to board a Covenant Corvette. We see John choking out Akerson and throwing him to the ground, which is going to be a great moment to watch. It's probably what leads to him being arrested and him fighting off these soldiers I mentioned before. And then the last shot is of Master Chief's helmet as he holds it at side just like in the Halo Infinite teaser trailer from 2018 and from episodes 4 and 6 of the first season of this show. The main thing about the last shot however is it's showing Chief on a Halo ring. You can see it rising up into the sky in the distance. How did it get there? We'll have to wait and see but I'm willing to bet Quan and Halsey get whatever portal there is on magical working and that's how. Point number 48, the end of the Halo Declassified video for episode 2 shows us a preview of what's coming up next in episode 3 specifically. Silver Team hears a signal that none of them recognises except for John which is most likely the same thing Tally heard on Sanctuary as she appears to be running a program to clean it up. We then see Silver Team moving towards a door that doesn't seem to be the same one Maquis ordered the Arbiter to rip off considering this one is intact and there isn't a blue glow coming from behind it but it would appear to be just normal lighting. It appears John might actually be in correct on where Cobalt Team was sent and him and his team find nothing at Visegrad's relay station and Key saying Chief had the delusion is because Chief told him he saw Maki on Sanctuary during a conversation between the two on what Silver Team was doing going into the relay and why Chief assaulted Marines who stood in his way. This could then explain why in episode 4 titled Reach, which appears to cover the Covenant's actual attack on the planet, Silver Team aren't able to access their armour. Along with the attack being a surprise attack, it could be that because of what Chief and Silver Team did at Visegrad, they've been taken off duty, which could then have been an elaborate plan of Akerson's all along to discredit Silver Team and all the Spartan 2s to then push his replacement for them, the Spartan 3s. To round all this off, my most disliked part of the first episode goes to Sorum being such an idiot to not suspect he was being led into a trap and planning for that accordingly. My most liked part of the first episode goes to seeing other Spartans and the banter between them all, very sibling rivalry-esque insults. My most disliked part of the second episode goes to the Marine guy in command being an idiot and just sending his men into unknown danger in the pitch black, just serving him up to be slaughtered. And my most liked part of the second episode goes to the return of Maki. I know a lot of people don't like her character, they think she doesn't make sense, but I find her a fascinating character exactly for that reason of her living with a race of aliens that wants to wipe out her entire race, but are treating her like royalty to get to cooperate, when in actuality, they hate her as well. We're looking at a down relay outpost 50 clicks from Visegrad. Point number one, if Visegrad sounds familiar to you, it's because it's the location Noble Team discovered the Covenant were on Reach in the game Halo Reach. Point number two, this captain handled this situation in such a moronic way, having all of her marines pointing their guns at Silver Team and then pointing her own at Chief, it's like she intentionally wanted to antagonise them and get a violent reaction. Point number three, so if the larger keystone wasn't secretly being held at Visigad Relay, where was it being held then when Maki and the Arbiter found it at the end of the last episode? Point number four, here we see Akerson's dad, who never actually gets named and is just called Akerson's father on both Wikipedia and IMDb, played by Scottish actor Bill Patterson. He's appeared in a lot of TV shows and movies, but his last role before this show was in House of the Dragon as Lyman Beesbury. Point number five, I wonder if Akerson's father and Uncle Arthur took inspiration from Star Wars Rebels when building this bridge, since to me it looks a lot like the symbol for Fulcrum. Point number six, so in the Silver Timeline, Akerson had a sister, Julia, whereas in the Blue Timeline, he had a brother, Ruin, who appeared in the comic book series Halo Uprising, which took place during the Battle for Earth. 
you know, when the Prophet of Regret's fleet attacked Earth at the start of Halo 2. He had himself injected with organic tracking material and convinced the Covenant to take him aboard the battlecruiser, the Harbinger of Piety, to talk to the Prophet, the Minister of Inquisition. The orbital defense platform Nassau then locked onto his position and destroyed the Covenant ship with its Mac gun. Point number seven. Well, I miscalled what Keyes was referring to when he said that Chief had a delusion. I thought Chief had told him he saw Maquis on Sanctuary, but instead, Chief believing Cobalt Team and the Covenant were at Physicad Relay was what Keyes was calling the delusion. Point number eight, Actis 4 is an actual planet from the Blue Timeline and first appeared in the comic book series Halo Escalation. In the Blue Timeline, they didn't actually investigate the surface of the planet until 2558, and when they did, they discovered foreigner structures. Presumably since the UNSC in the Silver Timeline know of Actis 4 in 2552, or is it 2553 now? They most likely checked out the planet and not found anything left behind by the foreigners. Point number 9, so I was right in my breakdown of the trailers that Lewis was in a relationship. I just got the person wrong. He ain't going out with Riz, but instead with Danilo, played by Christian Okoa Lavernia, who, fun fact, in 2023 was in a movie called The Covenant. And I'm sure a lot of morons hate that the show has introduced a homosexual relationship between an ex-Spartan and a normal guy, but those people are a dying breed and will soon no longer be a detriment to the progression of the human race. Point number 10, I love the juxtaposition between Riz and Kai here. Riz has gone to see Lewis to find out how to live a life outside of being a Spartan, as if she seems to be considering giving it up, whereas Kai has gone to Akerson to convince him to continue to let her fight, even if it means she has to do it without her team, as if she can't be anything else but a Spartan. Point number 11, I also love Akerson trying to convince Kai to let the idea of Chief getting better go, is also him trying to convince himself to let the idea of his dad getting better go, and go through with his dad's request of not letting the Covenant take him alive. Point number 12, Quan Ha talking about how she failed her planet and people by not being able to protect it like all the past generations of her family have, Quan, they wouldn't have been able to defend it against a collection of alien races capable of turning planets to glass from orbit either. Don't beat yourself up over it. Point number 13, I find it funny Quan says they can blend in with the arriving refugees when Lyra sticks out like a main anime character in a crowd of nobodies. Point number 14, I called it. I called the four dead bodies being Cobalt Team in my breakdown video of episodes 1 and 2. Add another W to the pile. A very sad W this time though. Poor Cobalt Team, we hardly knew thee especially Lee008, who we barely saw and didn't even hear speak. Point number 15, if you don't already know, dead Spartans are always listed as MIA, as per only Directive 930, as it is believed to list them publicly as KIA would be devastating for morale. This is where the phrase Spartans never die comes from. Point number 16, Keyes mentions the winter contingency and the 17th Silver Debrief on the Halo Waypoint website has this to say about it. This episode has a number of interesting connections to certain elements of core canon concerning the fall of Reach. No doubt you all caught Admiral Jacob Keyes name dropping Winter Contingency, an emergency protocol that serves as the namesake of the first playable mission in Halo Reach, where Noble Team discovers the Covenant already deployed on the planet. The Silver Debrief also goes on to talk about how Oni knew the Covenant were already on Reach. But something that these opening episodes of Season 2 have been exploring is the fact that the Office of Naval Intelligence knew about the Covenant's presence on Reach in advance of the main invasion. A series of data drops back in 2011 sought to deliver some truth and reconciliation around certain details and differences between the 2001 novel Halo The Fall of Reach and the game. These took the form of communiques between Admiral Margaret Parangoski and Vice Admiral Hieronymus Stanforth regarding Oni's statistical analysis efforts to track the Covenant's recent advances and determine which colonies stood the highest risk of invasion. By July 19th, 2552, the Epsilon Aridini system returned a probability of 87.2%, a parallel that the show drew in the previous episode in the conversation between Akerson and Cortana. This was a prescient result as Noble Team would discover the Covenant's presence on the planet less than a week later on July 23rd. As a result of this, Parangoski and Stanforth considered the viability of using Reach as an opportunity to launch Operation Red Flag, a last ditch effort to send the remaining Spartans to the Covenant homeworld, what would later be discovered to be high charity, with the objective of capturing a profit and forcibly negotiating a ceasefire. They note, however, that the military cost of such a gambit would be the greatest military sacrifice in human history. Point number 17, I find it funny Ackerson is acting both very Spartan and very unspartan-like here. And by Spartan, I mean the ancient Greek Spartans who fought against the Persian army at Thermopylae, even when they knew it would mean their deaths. They fought even though they weren't going to win. But then Ackerson says essential assets are being transported off the planet 
which to me just sounds like corporate speak for the leadership are fleeing to safety whilst leaving the civilians behind to die. That would be like if when King Leonidas found out Ephialtes had betrayed them, he fled back to Sparta whilst leaving all his men to die. Point number 18, base keys just telling it how it is straight to Akerson's face. Point number 19, in the Halo Declassified video for this episode, we get to see more of this location that they refer to as the Reach Undercity. Reminds me of the lower levels of Coruscant in Star Wars. The area in the Undercity that stood out to me the most was the Arcade, where you can see games such as Slip Space Invaders, the Spartan Attack game that was mentioned in the previous episode, which uses a fake assault rifle controller and looks like a VR Spartan helmet, and a Condor flight simulator. Point number 20, if Parangoski hasn't actually left Oni and is just posing as a civilian, I totally sort of called it in my previous breakdown video when I said, if Silver Timeline Parangoski had the same power, influence and secret knowledge that Blue Timeline Parangoski had, then her being made to take the fall for Halsey escaping and then becoming a, as she says, regular Joe, is the most impossible change the Silver Timeline has made from the Blue Timeline. Point number 21, damn, Silver Timeline Ackerson has so much more of a reason to hate Halsey than Blue Timeline Ackerson, considering she had his sister kidnapped to become a Spartan and replaced her with a Flash clone, intended to die shortly after. Kinda morbid though that ackerson has been making multiple clones of his own sister despite knowing they wouldn't live very long. Like, I get it if he was doing it as something to torment Halsey with, like, here's my sister you kidnapped and killed, and now you get to watch her die over and over again to remind you of that. But since Halsey asks Ackerson if he thought she didn't know who Julia was, that then doesn't seem to have been Ackerson's intentions at all. Point number 22, it's a good job and Taris and Karina decided to try and kill Lyra by suffocating her, since there's no way Quan would have been able to save her if Karina had decided to actually just pull the trigger. Point number 23, I've heard people complain that it makes no sense how Quan could take out Soren's crew, but when you consider the fact that they didn't know she was on board, so she had the element of surprise, and all she had to do was stab them in the neck to kill them silently, it's absolutely believable that she killed them. What doesn't make sense to me though, is where did Karina go after she tossed Lara into the airlock? Where was she when Quan killed Antares? And what was she doing just sneaking up behind Lara and Quan and not shooting them? Point number 24, I called it again, folks. All the way back when I broke down the official trailer for this season, I wondered who was narrating and saying this message from the Covenant. Was it McKee or someone who translated a Covenant message? I'll take another W, thank you very much. Point number 25, I wonder what Vanek pulls out of his locker here that he was hiding behind his boots. I like to think it's Jelly Babies. Also, is it just a regular thing for Spartans to hide things in their lockers under or behind other stuff? Point number 26, in my last breakdown video, we looked at the teams on the board with the help of Dill Pickle 6194's post on the r slash halo subreddit. In that post, they guessed the members of Gold Team were Nora075, Nicholas064, Oliver113, Claude148, Peter133, and Roof147. However, we get a clearer look at the members of Gold Team here, and we see instead of Nora075 and Nicholas064, it's instead May151 and Nikolai068. Both their names and service numbers are unique to the Silver Timeline. Also, I actually completely missed in my previous video that there is in fact a Spartan 2 called Lee008 in the Blue Timeline who first appeared in the novel First Strike. I just assumed all the names and service numbers of Cobalt Team were unique to the Silver Timeline. Another thing as well is that in the Blue Timeline, Lee is a man, whereas in the Silver Timeline, they're a woman. Point number 27, translating the Covenant message, Talia says, I am Avar Gatanai. Is this the name of the Silver Timeline Arbiter, or is it some form of title, like Arbiter? The archive of her own page of David J. Peterson, the person who has created the Covenant language for the show, posted the original Sanghili for Var Gatanai as being Barrow Gatanai. If Barrow Gatanai is meant to be the proper name for this Arbiter, why would it be translated as Var Gatanai? Proper names aren't meant to be translated. If Var Gatanai is actually meant to be the proper name for the Silver Timeline Arbiter though, it's interesting the show has gone with the AI suffix rather than the more common EE suffix like Felvadami, the name of the Blue Timeline Arbiter. According to the 2009 edition of the Halo Encyclopedia, which you can't buy on Kindle and costs way too much for physical, so I just have to go on what Halopedia tells me the book says, whilst the dash EE suffix denotes military service, the dash AI suffix denotes swordsmanship, which actually makes a lot of sense since the Silver Timeline Arbiter really seems to favour using his energy sword. Point number 28, it's a shame they didn't have the Arbiter say something similar to the Prophet of Regret's message to humanity, your destruction is the will of the gods and we are their instrument from the novel The Fall of Reach. Point number 29, I thought Talia was just using a program to clear up the interference to be able to hear the Sangheili speaking within it, but then the program also went to translate the speech as well. How? I mean, what? 
in the six months between the end of last season and the start of this one has Miranda Keys completely translated the Sangheili language, then created and publicly released a program so that other people can translate Sangheili speech as well or something? To round all this off, my most disliked part of the episode goes to the dumbass captain who thought it would be a good idea to point guns at Silver Team and act incredibly antagonistic towards Chief despite the fact she was told to convince him to stand down and return to base. And my most liked part of the episode goes to everything with Akerson, his interactions with his dad, with Kai, with Keys, with Halsey, Akerson and his actor Joseph Morgan are seriously still in the show so far. He is great. The Covenant are on reach. Point number one, so it turns out I'm a bit of a dum-dum. I mentioned in my previous video Huh, I wonder where the Greater Keystone was being kept when McKee and the Abbot found it, when all along the start of the scene showed a subtitle saying it took place at Sword Base. Thank you to user Big Blue Tits for commenting and pointing this out to me. Love your username by the way. It's doubly embarrassing as well because in my breakdown video of the We Need Master Chief trailer, I also went through the promotional images posted on the Hail of the Series Instagram which revealed the names for all the episodes. And I even wondered if the title of episode 2 being Sod could have been referring to Sod Base, a location of major significance in the game Halo Reach. So unfortunately what could have been a W if I hadn't missed a location subtitle instead turned into an L. Point number two, Keith. Yeah, fuck you Keith, your name is stupid. I actually wonder if the name Keith was picked because it rhymes with Chief, who after the events of episode 3, Vanek is not too happy with. Point number 3, we've seen at the end of the Halo Declassified video for episode 1, a preview of things to come this season, and it showed us Perez in Spartan 3 armor, and her losing her family and friends here is most likely the biggest reason why she chooses to become a Spartan 3. This ties in with the Spartan 3s of the blue timeline, as rather than being kidnapped specifically, selected 6 year olds, they were composed of regular kids who volunteered to fight the Covenant due to having lost family and friends. Point number 4, oh damn, I knew Reach had Gooters, but I didn't know they had T-Rexes as well. Point number 5, we're barely into the episode and already this fist fight and armorless chief has with his stealth elite goes to show it ain't the armor that makes him a spartan and a damn good soldier but how he is as a person point number six i'm guessing since none of the other stealth elites stuck around to help their buddy out their main objective wasn't to engage with anyone but to sneak their way to somewhere specific could have done a better job at sneaking though by not tossing around any humans in their path. Point number seven, I find it funny that you could totally apply this conversation between Talia and Chief to actually playing as Chief in the games. You know what to expect, especially if you're playing a level for the 11th time, the plasma and death doesn't phase you, and you know at the end, Chief isn't going to die because he never does and probably never will. Point number eight, I love the antiques woman has herself an original Xbox and a couple of Duke controllers. This is the second Xbox Easter egg in the show after one appeared in the fourth episode of the first season. Maybe we'll see another Xbox summer in the fourth episode of the third season. I hope so. Point number nine. ONI access only. Oh my god, can people stop saying ONI and just say ONI? ONI sounds so weird to hear. Point number 10, it's interesting how he tells Soren here that she knew the moment she saw him that he wanted to be a Spartan because in the blue timeline, he is the only one she gave a choice to, to become a Spartan or to be put into a foster home. He accepted her offer and then later when he was given the choice of going through the augmentations or not, he accepted again. Halsey described him as being an experiment within an experiment and I wonder if she ever really did give him a choice. Can you really give a choice to someone who you already strongly suspect beforehand will say yes? Point number 11. He said it! He said it! Point number 12. Mad respect to Chief for not having an issue with Lewis, a blind guy, being in a firefight. If the guy wants to fight, let him fight. He used to be a Spartan. He knows what he's capable of. Point number 13. If anyone's got an issue with fully automatic battle rifles, just know that's always been a thing. And if you didn't have an issue with them being fully automatic in Halo Landfall, the collective name for three short live action films which came out in 2007, then you shouldn't have an issue with them being fully automatic here. Point number 14. So yeah, in behind the scenes clips from the Halo Declassified videos, we see the ends of the guns light up when the trigger is pulled to let the effects people know when to apply muzzle flashes. Seems they could have done a bit of a better job in this shot though of making it not just look like a torch being turned on and off. Point number 15. Ah damn, losing both Danilo and Lewis. This could go either way for Riz now. Either she's going to give up fighting because of seeing too many friends die or convince her to remain a Spartan and keep on fighting. 
My money's on the latter. Point number 16, so what? Did McKee and the Arbiter just happen to arrive at Cortana at the same time as Halsey and Sorin or something? Did McKee and the Arbiter know Cortana was being kept there? And what about Halsey? Did she know or just suspect? This at least explains why in the season preview at the end of the Hill of the Classified video for episode 1, we see Cortana speaking to someone in the Sangheili language. She's most likely talking to McKee about John. Point number 17, okay, how strong was that grenade or how volatile was that room to cause such an explosion it launched Halsey and Soren off the ground and into the wall? Like seriously. Point number 18, I don't know why, I just find it funny, John, Riz and Talia marching with BRs and a couple of Marines just come up to them I'm like, we'll take those, thank you very much. I mean, what, is there a no guns allowed policy or something? Point number 19, again this feels like something right out of the games. You play through a mission fighting alongside marines, and at the end, it really is just like they stop existing for Chief and the player. Point number 20, if Agassin taking Silver Team's Majolnit armor, despite the fact that it would give them a much higher chance of not dying, isn't something you're convinced he would do, let me remind you that in the blue timeline, he literally tried to kill the Master Chief. During a field test, he threw anti tank mines, ODSTs, chain guns, and an airstrike against a Spartan, but he failed to kill Chief though, obviously. Point number 21, hearing Keys and John mention the groundside plants powering the orbital max stations tickles the law part of my brain, as in the fall of Reach, Chief has Fred 104 take command of the Red Team, composed of 22 Spartan 2s, including Fred, and orders them to defend the power generators from Covenant ground forces for as long as possible. Point number 22, Chief mentioning Thermopylae is interesting, not just because it's where 300 Spartans and a bunch of other Greeks held off Xerxes' much larger Persian army for 7 days, but because episode 7 of this season is in fact called Thermopylae. So are we going to get another holding a large enemy force at a choke point scenario again in episode 7? Point number 23. Do you have any idea what just happened in there? Uh, no, he doesn't. He doesn't know what Katana is at all. Point number 24. Well, that explains how Sauron got away without his ship being shot down like it was in the blue timeline. How's he just let him go? It's interesting to consider that if his arm hadn't been deformed in augmentation and he hadn't decided to leave, he'd be the Spartan every other Spartan looked up to. He'd be the Master Chief. Point number 25. If there aren't supposed to be any Covenant ships over Reach, then where are these plasma bolts coming from and what are the turrets shooting at? Banshees? Seraphs? Point number 26, top tier inspirational motivational speech from Keyes here, up there with President Whitmore's speech in Independence Day and Captain Mifuni's speech in The Matrix Revolutions. And if you've gotten to this point in Season 2 and its painfully obvious message has gone over your head, Key spells it out clearly here that Master Chief isn't just the armour he wears. He's not just a guy in a suit, no matter what Ackerson believes. Master Chief is John. He is a man. The man is the hero, not the armour. Point number 27. Key's got to drop two F-bombs this season, and I love it, since it's something I couldn't hear Key's doing in Halo Combat Evolved. When would be the best times for Keys in Combat Evolved to drop an F-bomb, I wonder though? When do you guys think he could have said it? Point number 28, I love the shared sentiments between the Spartans, what with how we had Lewis saying, I'm right where I need to be, and now Chief here says, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Point number 29, it's neat we get to see not just a Wraith, but also a Scorpion tank this episode, and the Scorpion being at a bridge reminds me of the Halo 2 level Metropolis, and the bridge going to be blown up reminds me of the Halo 3 ODST level Oni Alpha Site. Point number 30, Hello, Jacob. Catherine. And... Dundee. Point number 31. This is a good question. Where the hell is Miranda? Out of all the trailers and Halo Declassified previews, we've only ever gotten one quick shot of her. I wonder if the reason we haven't seen much of her is because it would spoil that she's actually working on Akersen's Spartan 3s, which is what I suspect she's been doing all this time. Point at number 32, so I thought these cable things were already there when Sauron walks towards the edge, but they actually all appear out of nowhere between shots, and you can even see a new one get thrown up on the right. Did Sauron and the Marines nearby just stand and watch as all these cables were thrown up? and I had to assume the Jackals were only just a few levels down since they would have had to climb up the cables impossibly fast to get to the top from ground level that quick. Point number 33, I don't have an issue with the show killing keys here, but I do have a bit of an issue with the execution of them killing off keys. Why do the Jackals just stop shooting and just stare at him? Do they somehow know who he is? Like, do the Covenant have a list of most wanted humans for capture and interrogation or something? I mean, most casual Halo fans probably don't realise how intelligent Jackals are, and due to their profiteering nature, would be the most likely Covenant race to capture high-ranking humans in return for a reward. Point number 34, mad respect to the people making this show to have the balls to kill off Keys in a new way rather than just doing his death from Halo Combat Evolved again. 
really got me interested where they're going to take their version of the Halo story if they're willing to deviate from the blue timeline as significantly as this. Point number 35, I'm sorry, but is anyone else not a fan of the way Pablo Schreiber reloads? Him slamming in the, I presume, CGI magazine like he does just seems off to me. Point number 36, how the heck did Vanek and these Marines manage to let a Jackal get past them? It's a good thing he didn't decide to turn around and stab or shoot the humans in the back and instead just stood around waiting for Chief to jump over and bash it in its face. Point number 37, you could kind of see towards the end of episode 2 that something was up with one of the Arbiter's eyes, but this episode clearly shows us that he might actually be blind in his left eye as it's white in colour and there's scarring on the skin around it. Point number 38, this Arbiter seems like a combination of Thelvadami, the Arbiter of the mainline Halo games, and Ripper Marami, the Arbiter in the first Halo Wars game. Thelvadami, as mentioned in the second terminal of Halo 2 Anniversary, displayed honour when he caught the Marines of the 3rd Battalion Reserves unawares and allowed them to armour and arm themselves before attacking. This Arbiter shows similar honour by killing the Elite who shot Chief and ruined their honourable duel, but this casual killing of a comrade is very reminiscent of the ruthlessness of Ripper Marami. It also reminded me of Game of Thrones at Season 1 Episode 5 when Jaime Lannister and Ned Stark duel, but then Jaime knocks out a Lannister soldier who intervened by stabbing Ned in the leg. Point number 39, Chief was hit by a plasma pistol that went right through him even without it being overcharged. I would have believed it more that it went right through him if it had been a shot from a plasma rifle, but for some reason we haven't really seen any plasma rifles being used much this season. Point number 40, plus one W. I speculated in my breakdown of the official trailer that the reason we weren't seeing much of Vanek in the trailers was because he would be the first of Silver Team to die. And then in my breakdown of the We Need Master Chief trailer, I believe we actually saw how he was going to die, stabbed by an elite with a needle shard. Wait. I was right twice on two separate occasions, does that mean I get two W's? I've also seen people speculating that since Vanek's now dead, that could mean Soren might join Silver Team. Ignoring the fact that Silver Team doesn't just have to always be composed of four members, I mean we've seen on the board in previous episodes that other Spartan teams have more or fewer than four members. It also reminds me of comedian Stephen K. Amos's segment in Series 3 Episode 6 of Live at the Apollo where he jokes that the BBC has a diversity policy and he has to wait for any Henry to die before he can get his own TV show. One in, one out. Let's not rock the boat. I also wouldn't be surprised if some people tried to unironically accuse the people making this show and who wrote this episode of being racist since Lewis, Keyes and Vanek are all black and all get killed off. Point number 41, Chief felt nothing when he remembered losing Nora 098 on Mamor due to having his peloton at the time but he definitely feels losing Vanek here and can now maybe also sympathise a bit more with Talia losing her family and friends. Point number 42, now let's look at the preview for the next episode from the end of the episode's Halo Declassified video. Quan and Lara have made quick work in getting to Reach as we see Quan helping Halsey in keeping John alive. Lara and Soren talk to a guy who looks like a discount Luke Skywalker from the sequel trilogy about finding Kessler and then we see Maki asking the Avatar to believe in her because she is the Blessed One. You can see as well High Charity in the background behind and in the shot of the Arbiter, there are holographic trees on the left. Are they on a Covenant ship or a captured human ship? I called it that the mother would return somehow. She's too unique looking of a character to just be a one and done. The question is, is she actually alive and on reach or is she appearing to Quan in her vision? Is the whole bonfire scene with the red robe people, with Riz, with Halsey, with Chief, is it all just a vision? The mother tells Quan to not deny her name and her purpose, saying what sounds like, save me I think? and it's close now to Quan whilst we get a shot of the monster cave wall drawing. I thought at first she also said protect her as well, but after listening to it a few more times, I think she's actually just calling Quan protector. A quick shot of Kai putting on her helmet, which then most likely will lead into her seeing the army of Spartan 3's Agassin has made so far as we've seen in the trailers. And then we hear Cortana say they're losing Chief and asking someone to help him as we get quick flashes of McKee and Chief being on a Halo ring from season 1, someone wearing a face mask with a torch who could be Miranda, and then the shot of Parangoski that we saw in the Fighters 1 trailer. To round all this off, my most disliked part of the episode goes to the use of energy swords. Look, energy swords are cool and all, but I feel at this point the people making this show are just having the elites constantly using them to include more close quarters combat. What happened to all the plasma rifles and gunfights from Season 1? Well, at least the elites are actually trying to use a melee weapon when closing the distance with whom they are trying to kill, unlike in recent movies and TV shows where characters forget that guns are ranged weapons and so they don't need to match right up to whom they are trying to shoot. 
In fact, that's how Jin Ha got himself stabbed in season one. And my most liked part of the episode goes to Keezy's speech. Need I say more? Alaria, you hear it? Point number one, I love how they've made Sora more quippy and smart mouth this season. He may be a bad man, but he does at least have a sense of humour. Point number two, after being teased to appear in the show again in promotional images, we finally get to see our first brute of season two, and they're still just as sad to kill as they were in season one. Also, have we still seriously not seen any grunts yet this season? You know, one of the most numerous members of the Covenant, along with drones and Lek Golo. And speaking of Lek Golo, I'm still holding out hope we get to properly see at least one hunter this season, though the usual pair would be better. Point number three, we saw Chief reloading a bunch in the last episode, but Riz and Sorin must have the bandana skull turned on since they barely ever reload and Riz fires way more shots with her pistols than she should really be able to. Point number four, if the show followed the book The Fall of Reach and had Spartans defending the Mac Array's groundside power stations, well then I guess they fail just like they did in the blue timeline, allowing Covenant ships to get into glassing range. Point number five, so the shot of Parangoska we got in the Fighters 1 trailer was actually a flashback to when they removed Cortana from Chief. I wonder what Parangoski asked Cortana to do for her in exchange for reviving John. I mean, Cortana was helping Akerson by running simulations for him, and later on in the episode, Halsey tells John that allowing Reach to fall was a political manoeuvre by Parangoski and Akerson to allow them to take control of how the war with the Covenant is fought. Could Cortana have been aiding them in their scheming? And could Akerson leaving Cortana behind on Reach be also part of her helping Parangoski? It would be the height of stupidity to leave humanity's first smart AI that contains the entirety of human knowledge behind to be captured by the Covenant. Did Parangoski want Cortana to be captured? That could explain how Maquis and the Arbiter knew about Cortana and where to find her. Information on Cortana was leaked so that it would lead the Covenant, possibly even Maquis specifically, to Cortana. So could Cortana's mission now be to function as some sort of Trojan horse? I've also seen people theorising that Cortana has either been copied or has split herself and Maki and the Arbiter only have part of her, whilst the other part is either with Parangoski and Akerson or still inside Chief, staying silent and waiting to reveal herself. What do you guys think Parangoski asked Cortana to do for her? Let me know in the comments. Point number six, the inside of this Covenant ship's not looking as purple as I would have liked. Shame. Point number seven, Var Gatanai talking about Maki's gift and prophecy most likely refers to the vision she has when she touches one of the keystones and could be why she won't let the Arbiter kill Chief because she has seen him on the Halo ring with her just like in Season 1. She also says she has seen that the Arbiter will be the one to lead them to Halo though I wonder if that's true or not since she could just be lying to him that that is his destiny so that she can keep him as an ally. I wonder as well what Gatanai could have done to be made an Arbiter. Could he have been given the blame for Silver Team escaping with both the Keystones at the end of Season 1? And what does he mean when he says McKee lives only by his grace? Does that mean he made sure she survived after being shot at the end of Season 1? Or does it mean he is now the only thing that stands between her and the other Covenant that want to kill her? Point number 8, so rather than being the Supreme Commander of the Fleet of Particular Justice as Felvadami was in the Blue Timeline, before he became the Arbiter, Vargat and I used to be the Supreme Commander of the First Fleet of Solemn Accord. We don't hear about a First Fleet of Solemn Accord in the Blue Timeline, but we do hear of a Second Fleet, which appeared in the novel The Fall of Reach. The 24-ship fleet engaged 48 UNSC ships at Sigma Octanus IV and were in a sense both defeated and victorious. Defeated in that the UNSC ships managed to get off two salvos of Mac rounds at the Covenant ships by having the repair station Cradle sacrifice itself by acting as a shield to block incoming Covenant missiles after the first salvo, allowing the ships to dedicate all power to recharging their Mac guns. The two Mac salvos reduced the number of Covenant ships to eight, which the UNSC ships then engaged and drove off, though the UNSC still suffered significant losses even with the numerical advantage. The second fleet of Southern Accord was victorious however in that they managed to scan a foreigner artifact that was being kept in the Cote de Jure Museum of Natural History which gave them the location of Installation 04. It was in fact scans of this very same artifact that Cortana was decrypting during the fall of Reach which then gave her the location of Installation 04, allowing her to slit space jump the Pillar of Autumn to it as it fled the planet. The Covenants were also victorious in that they had managed to secretly attach a spy probe onto the UNSC Iroquois which then led them to Reach. Point number nine, so I remember saying at one point that Cortana speaking Sangheili in the preview of what's to come this season at the end of the Halo Classified video for episode one is her speaking to McKee about John. I thought this because to me it sounded like the first word she says here is John, but it turns out she isn't saying John at all. I got it right guessing she was talking to McKee about him though. Is that like half a W then? 
a V. Point number 10, Quan Ha annoys me this episode, though probably not for the same reason that she annoys everyone else. Quan Ha in this episode trying to dictate how Chief should mourn Vanek reminds me of the character Liv Malone from the British TV show Skins, who in series 6, after the death of her friend Grace Blood, flips out as all of their mutual friends who aren't mourning Grace's death in the way she wants them to. Lyra kind of does the same thing as well with Soren getting annoyed, he isn't feeling and acting like she wants him to, but that I can understand more since they're a mother and father trying to find their son. Point number 11, we arrive at the namesake of this episode, Alaria, and the 19th silver debrief on the Halo Waypoint website has this to say about the planets. Alaria first appeared in Halo Nightfall, the live action web series that released in 2014 to introduce Mike Coulter as Jameson Locke. In Nightfall and its peripheral second stories, additional scenes to provide further insight into the characters and events of this story, we learned that Alaria was once a thriving outer colony, but has recently become an inhospitable wasteland, dry and desolate, ruled by smugglers and pirates after its government and economy collapsed. The instability of Elduros, Alaria's son, has caused a planet-wide drought known as the Devil's Kiss. A rain has not fallen on the planet for a hundred years. Alaria, subsequently, featured in several of Kelly Gay's novels centred around Ryan Forge and her crew aboard the Ace of Spades. Two of Ryan's crewmates, Nico and Lesser, are siblings who were orphaned on Alaria and originally attempted to con Ryan, but instead of turning them over to the local authorities, she offered them positions aboard her ship. Nico as a navigation officer and tech expert, and Lesser as the pilot. Point number 12. I taught you everything except how to quit. Excuse me, Halsey, but I think Mendez might have something to say about that. Point number 13, so I get Akerson in both timelines and Parangoski in the Silver timeline would be perfectly happy in leaving Halsey to die on Reach. But considering Blue Timeline Parangoski described the Spartan 2s as the single most expensive project in our section, they are, however, also the most effective. I doubt she'd go along with her Silver Timeline counterpart's plan in leaving the Spartan 2s on Reach without their armor to also die. Also, bit extreme of Akerson to not only leave Spartans on Reach to die, but also to capture Sorin and put him on Reach in the hopes that the Covenant will also kill him. Akerson really wanted to wipe the board completely before bringing out his own pieces to fight with. Point number 14. You can't grieve an entire planet. I don't know, Spock gave it a pretty good try. Point number 15. Hmm, I wonder what Cortana said to Chief before she was removed from his brain. My guess is she told him where to find Parangoski and Akerson. She told him about Onyx, which is revealed to be at the end of this episode where Kai has been all along with Akerson. Point number 16, yeah, I don't think Chief is referring really to being chosen to be a Spartan, but being chosen to be THE Spartan, the one who would lead them, who would be the one they all look up to, the one who would become a symbol and hero of humanity. That's at least what I think he was referring to, though Halsey later says it wasn't her who chose him to be put on the path he's on, but instead it was the foreigners, which does relate to the blue timeline. Point number 17, so the couple hear Lara shouting for Kessler and don't think to even mention that the boy they've adopted isn't called Kessler? Are they just assuming the kid must have given them a fake name? Or do they think if they say the boy isn't called Kessler, Lara and Soren won't believe them? Or did Kessler give the boy his name as well as his helmet? Point number 18, so Soren saying he lives in fear of Kessler not feeling loneliness or the absence of love is because he'd rather his son feel that than feeling loved by complete strangers and forgetting about his parents. Right? Point number 19, Halsey reveals that Vanek's surname was Amadi and that he was born on the planet Tribute, a planet that exists in the blue timeline, appearing for the first time in the novel Contact Harvest, and was actually the birthplace of Spartan 2, Charis 137. Point number 20. I'm already dead. So is this meant to be what the mother was referring to in episode 1 when she told she she could see his death coming? Point number 21, while I did call that the mother would return as a vision to Quan, I didn't call that she'd be speaking for all the planets somehow. I wonder if these visions Quan is receiving are connected to some sort of foreigner Gius. A Gius or Gene Song being a genetic command placed within an organism or species by the foreigners, which can lay dormant until activated. As such, Quan's dad's death and the subsequent vision quest she went on could have activated her Gius. It could either be that, or she's instead receiving visions from the Monitor or Madrigal trying to communicate with her, or maybe a combination of the two. Point number 22. I mean, McKee isn't wrong when she says the Prophets have made Gatanai an Arbiter because they fear him, as in the blue timeline the Prophets would make elites who were getting too powerful or asking too many questions into Arbiters, and then sent them out on Chop Suey missions to get rid of them. The Prophets even did the same thing to Aatrox, sending him out on Chop Suey mission after Chop Suey mission, hoping he would finally die and no longer pose a threat to them. They made him an Arbiter in all but name. Point number 23, I've seen some people having an issue with Gatanai turning against the Prophets as it feels incredibly rushed compared to Thel Vadami turning against them in the blue timeline. 
timeline. But I think it's a bit of an unfair comparison. Vadami turned against the prophets, rejected the great journey having learned it was false and also allied with humanity. Gatanai has only turned against the prophets because he believes listening to Maki is the best way to get to the halo and start the great journey. Much less extreme in my opinion. Point number 24, so the UNSC has captured Kessler. Makes sense since he is the son of a Spartan at all. If Halsey showed interest in him in the previous episode, it would make sense others would as well, such as Parangoski and Ackerson. Point number 25, well I completely miscalled what Riz would do. I thought seeing Danilo, Lewis and Vanek die in the last episode might convince her to remain a Spartan, but nope, she instead takes the path of Lewis and decides to settle down. Good for her, just gotta hope the Covenant don't show up. Point number 26, and to end the episode off, we see Kai, Ackerson and the army of Spartan 3s he's managed to amass on the planet Onyx, which first appeared in the blue timeline in the novel Ghosts of Onyx, and was the place Ackerson chose to have the Spartan 3s trained. And Kai here seems to be following a similar path to Kurt Ambrose, formerly known as Spartan 051. Kurt, during a mission requiring him to be floating around in space, was listed as MIA when his jetpack malfunctioned, which sent him flying off randomly into deep space. This, however, turned out to have been planned by Oni and Ackerson so that they could retrieve Kurt and secretly recruit him to train the Spartan 3s, which is what Ackerson seems to have brought Kai to Onyx to do in this timeline. Point number 27, now let's look at the preview for the next episode from the end of this episode's Halo Declassified video. John somehow found out where Parangoski and Ackerson are, and we see at least him and Soren on Onyx, though we only see Chief on his own going through the base. Parangoski tells Ackerson Chief has been seen, and Kai is surprised to see Chief is alive, whilst looking at a security monitor, so she either just believed he had died on reach or had been told he had. Soren and Chief spotted that more Spartans are still being made, and then interestingly we have Cortana telling Chief to touch the lesser keystone, though he says he doesn't know where it is. Is this actually Cortana, or is Chief just hallucinating or having a Quan-like vision? And if it is Cortana, then that would mean she either was copied or split herself, which still begs the question, is she still in John's head or somewhere in the base? Or 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 is this just a trick the people who put the preview together are playing on us and it turns out Cortana is actually just speaking to McKee on the Covenant ship and Chief is speaking to someone else entirely on Onyx. We then see Kai aiming her gun at an exploding door which I think will then lead to Chief walking in and confronting her, her taking her helmet off and then we get the shot of her stopping him and giving him an angry look from the season preview at the end of the classified video from episode 1. Chief beats up a bunch of soldiers as we also saw him do in the season preview and the shot of Chief pinning Axe into the wall by his throat and then throwing him to the ground from that season preview will most likely happen in this episode. Chief touches the lesser keystone and I wonder what he will see. Will he and McKee have a shared vision again just like they started to do in the latter half of season 1 or will the distance between them mean he instead will just have visions of his past again like in the former half of season 1. Finally we have Ackerson saying you're too late. I wonder who he's talking to and what he is talking about. To round all this off, my most disliked part of the episode goes to Halsey saying Riz has chosen to be a nobody. God, Halsey has been a lot more snacky this season compared to the first, which is within character, but saying that to Riz, one of her own Spartans, I'm glad Riz threw it back in her face by laughing and walking away. And my most liked part of the episode goes to seeing more McKee and Arbiter. They're both characters I'm really interested in seeing and learning more about, so it was nice to actually spend a decent amount of time with them this episode. What do you know about this place? Onyx. Point number one, the Spartan 3s being called Assault Unit Javelin could be a reference to Halsey's mention of Project Javelin in her journal. She speculated that the Spartans of Noble team that she didn't recognise could either come from a parallel program which she refers to as Javelin or were next-gen Spartans created by someone copying her work. Point number two, I find it a bit odd Kai explaining the details of the mission after they've already attempted it and failed it in a simulation. It's almost as if she's instead explaining it for us, the audience. Point number three, I wonder how Talia even even ended up on Onyx. The ship she escaped reach on was primarily for evacuating civilians, so I find it highly unlikely it would have had an autopilot or coordinates inputted that would have taken it to Onyx. Unless Keyes knew about Onyx, he did seem to know where Miranda was, he just wouldn't tell Halsey, and he inputted the coordinates before he left the ship and, you know, died. Point number four, speaking of Onyx, the silver debrief for this episode on the Halo Waypoint website goes into detail on the planet in its core connections section. The thing is, they go into quite a bit of detail, so rather than me reading it all out and slowing this video down, if you would like to read it for yourself, just pause and read the screenshots I'm showing now. Point number five, pretty shitty of Kai to assume Talia was just a veteran of one battle. Talia used to be a marine and had at least seen combat on Sanctuary, who knows how many other battles she'd been a part of before that. Point number six. Oh, so what we saw in the preview of this episode from the end of last episode's The Classified video wasn't Kai preparing to face Chief as he blew his way through a door, but just her playing out the fall of Reach. Point number seven. This is where Halsey says it all started. Oni. 
Wait, what? Only started on Onyx? Am I misunderstanding what Soren is saying here, or is Soren misunderstanding what Halsey was saying? Point number eight, well, these two guys are deaf as doormats, not hearing their comrades screaming behind them. Point number nine, so rather than being a giant brand applied once, the mark of shame in this timeline is smaller and appears to be applied repeatedly in the same location like a form of self-flagellation. Point number 10, so according to the subtitles, this Sangheili priest is called Uto Umdama, which is very interesting for two reasons. One, Umdama is also the name of Jewel Umdama, an elite in the blue timeline who first appeared in the novel Glasslands and were going to create and lead his own covenant, the very same covenant you fight against in Halo 4 and 5. And two, Jewel Umdama used to go by umdama E when he was a soldier in the Prophet's Covenant, the EE suffix denoting military service. Thus, after the Great Schism, Joel, along with the other Sangheili, stopped using the EE suffix as they were no longer part of the original covenant. So it's interesting that Uto Umdama here doesn't have any sort of suffix attached to his name. Whilst not ending in EE, Vargatanai's name at least ends in AI, which denotes swordsmanship according to the 2009-2011 edition of the Halo Encyclopedia. Uto Umdama is still a part of the covenant, so he should have some sort of suffix, unless his name is Uto Umda and his suffix is MA, which could denote that he is a priest. Point number 11, speaking of Uto being a priest, you may think it unusual for Sangheili, a race of warriors, to have priests, but this is something that can actually be found in the blue timeline in the form of the Asketics. As explained in old HaloWaypoint.com posts, the Asketics were an ancient warrior order with deep ties to ancient Sangheili beliefs, fervently devoted to their pre-covenant faith. While the Asketics military forces had been formally dissolved following the formation of the covenant at the Writ of Union, Asketic priests continued to secretly initiate worthy Sangheili warriors into their ranks, keeping the ideals of their martial order alive within the Covenant. In fact, Uzi Taham, the fourth co-op character in Halo 3, was approached twice by the Ascetics to join them, once when the Sangheili were part of the Covenant, and again after the Great Schism. Point number 12, so even after dying in the simulation, those who get killed stay jacked in. So what? Does their view switch to spectating their comrades like in the games? Point number 13, why is Mullins even in charge? Sounds like Talia is the one who knows how to lead and should be in command. Gives me Captain Herbert Sobel from Band of Brothers vibes, which is fitting since the Spartan 3s are being trained at Camp Kurihi, and it's near the Kurihi Mountain that Easy Company trains in Band of Brothers, with the first episode of the show even being called Kurihi. Point number 14, Oh, I hope to the forward as Briggs here gets what's coming to her. She's getting way too cocky for her own good. Point number 15, ah, classic Akerson manipulation. Though in the blue timeline, he used those skills to manipulate the Covenant so as to try and save his brother Ruin's life, not to have a Spartan 2 try and murder the Master Chief. Point number 16, so it appears dying and being brought back to life has affected McKee's ability to activate foreigner technology. Either that or people speculating she's some form of clone are correct, and she just doesn't possess the same histone proteins as the original McKee for some reason. Point number 17, this is not the first time we've heard of stone foreigner architecture changing shape. In the blue timeline in the novel The Thursday War, the Temple of the Abiding Truth on St. Helios had stone walls and symbols on those stone walls that could reconfigure themselves. Point number 18, Kai's been on such an emotional roller coaster. She followed in John's footsteps in the first season by removing her pellet and then dyed her hair in an attempt to be her own person, but then at the start of this season, John tells her he doesn't need her as a friend, but as a Spartan, but now she's doubling down on being a Spartan, he says he preferred her when she was more than just that. Make up your damn mind, Chief. Do you want her to be a Spartan and to follow orders without question, or do you want her to be human, your friend, and for her to trust you even when you disobey orders? Point number 19, did Parangoski and Akerson seriously not order Kai to bring in Chief's body, or at the very least send out a team to retrieve it to confirm he was in fact dead? Point number 20, so Cortana isn't still in Chief's head, but she also really isn't on Onyx either. She never copied or split herself. She's just transmitting herself into the base assistance from Vargatanai's ship. And it appears all along Cortana was in fact intended to be captured by the Covenant to act as a Trojan horse and gather information on where the first fleet of Solomon Accord will be so only can lay a trap for them. This is then what the Spartan 3s have most likely been training for, to swarm the Covenant ships, board, upload a virus to disable them Independence Day style, and thus make them easy pickings for the UNSC's missiles and MAC guns. We have seen though in the trailers this plan might not go as smoothly as Oni will want it to, with Covenant ships still engaging and destroying human ships. And I doubt Parangoski was expecting Cortana to have to actually aid Maki in finding out where Halo is in order to gain her trust so as to be given access to the ship's communications, or that she would completely invade Camp Kurihi's systems in order to talk to and aid Master Chief. Parangoski is seriously underestimating Cortana, 
But then again, Cortana is the first smart AI ever made in the Silver Timeline, so it's believable Parangoski wouldn't be able to know her full capabilities. Point number 21, wow, with two episodes left in this season, we finally get to see Miranda and where she's been since last season, and it turns out she's been messing around with some foreigner structures on Onyx, which leaves me very confused. It really seemed, to me at least, that in season 1, the lesser keystone was the first time humanity or at the very least Halsey, had ever seen something alien that wasn't Covenant. But now it turns out Halsey has actually spent a fair bit of her life in this cave system, studying these foreigner ruins, and that Oni is also aware of them. I wonder also what the mistake Halsey made was, and I wonder if these foreigner ruins will somehow be connected to how they get to Halo, rather than it being the well and the monitor that was on Madrigal, since, you know, we see a ring statue, and it'd be a bit confusing to also introduce the shield world sarcophagus from the blue timeline into the show at this point. Legit though, it does just kind of feel like the writers for this season said, oh yeah, you know that stuff that was being set up on Madrigal in the first season? Well, let's just cut and paste it onto Onyx instead. Point number 22, so as I've mentioned before, Thermopylae is where 300 Spartans and a bunch of other Greeks held off Xerxes' much larger Persian army for seven days. Chief mentioned it in episode 4 of this season in reference to Keys setting up a choke point, and also episode 7, the next episode, is in fact called Thermopylae, but why? Is it some training simulation done IRL that Soren has had to do before when he was trained to become a Spartan and that's why he recognises it? Point number 23, I love the dawning realisation between Talia and Kai throughout this episode that the Spartan 3s, just like in the blue timeline, are being used as expendable soldiers intended to be sent out on Chop Suey missions. Maybe that's why in the trailers we see Kai standing with her Spartan 3s in a troop bay ready to jump out into space. Maybe that's not a simulation but real life and Kai is jumping with her trainees so that she can fight alongside them, increasing their odds of survival. And speaking of survival, I wonder if Talia will survive this season, or maybe she'll go out sacrificing herself on a Covenant ship like Samuel 034 or Tom A293 or George 052. Point number 24, I like this twist on the Arbiter turning against his comrades. In the blue timeline, Thelvadami goes against the Covenant because he learns the Great Journey is false, whereas Vargatanai here goes against the Covenant because he believes so much in the Great Journey. Point number 25, ah, god damn you episode blue ballsing us right as John and McKee touch the keystones. What do you guys think will happen? Will John and McKee have a vision of each other on the Halo again? Will McKee see anything at all since Foreigner Tech no longer reacts to her? Will the Foreigner Ruins Miranda, Halsey and Quanarat activate? Point number 26. Now this would usually be the point where I will go over the preview for the next episode from the end of this episode's The Classified video. However, I have decided I much prefer to go in blind into episodes so I won't be covering the previews anymore. This also connects to me no longer breaking down trailers. I normally wouldn't check out trailers because again I like to go into watching something blind but I started watching and breaking them down for YouTube because I thought it would make good content. However, I'm going back to not watching trailers so I won't be breaking down for instance Instance, the official trailer for the Fallout TV show that recently came out. Sorry. Also, I found if I did break down the trailers or previews for next episodes, I'd usually just end up either repeating myself or leaving stuff out because I figured I'd already covered it before, so I won't go into detail again. And I prefer to go into detail in my actual review and breakdown videos of the episodes rather than in my videos of the trailers because I feel in the long run, more people watch my episode breakdowns than my trailer breakdowns. To round all this off, my most disliked part of the episode goes to not being able to see the Elite vs Elite fight more clearly. Yes, I know the focus is meant to be on McKee during the fight, but still. And my most liked part of the episode goes to the Kai and Chief fight. While I still stand by the fact that obviously you can see more emotion from characters if you can actually see their face emoting, Kate Kennedy did a very good job showing what Kai was feeling through her body language, her struggle on whether to keep beating Chief up or to stop. We're outnumbered, but if we can concentrate our forces... I guess it, sir. Thermopylae. Point number one, McKee mentions high charity to Chief. Does he even know what that is though? Did McKee tell him about it back when they were hanging out together in season one? Point number two. What if there are no sides? Owning life and death, light and dark, us and them. But has McKee been watching Game of Thrones? This isn't about noble houses. This is about the living and the dead. Point number three. No wonder Uta Omdama is a priest since he makes a pretty shitty warrior. Missing McKee when she doesn't even really dodge, having to stop and catch his breath. They're not even being able to react fast enough to stab McKee behind him. He couldn't even take her down with him a meal style. Point number four, Parangoski name drops Stanforth, a character from the Blue Timeline who first appeared in the novel The Fall of Reach and who was a big supporter of Halsey, used to be head of Section 3 of Oni and commanded the UNSC forces during the Battle of Sigma Octanus IV and The Fall of Reach, where he died when his ship, the Leviathan, was destroyed. Point number five. Stop right there! <laughs> 
point number six, I wonder what angle the show is going with here in regards to the foreigners. Will they be the same as humans or will they be separate? To me, with Halsey saying she found both foreigner and human DNA, it sounds like they might go with them being separate, but who knows. Point number seven, so I was right when I called that Thermopylae is IRL training that Soren had to go through when becoming a Spartan, but like he says, it was less about defending the past and more about learning what it means to be a Spartan, fighting rather than running. Which of course applies to the Spartan 3s, but the situation happening with them is like a twisted version of Thermopylae. It remains the same as the historical battle that there are significantly less Spartans than Persians slash covenants but unlike history it isn't the persians slash covenant assaulting the well-positioned and defended spartans but the spartans assaulting the well-positioned and defended persians slash covenants point number eight i made a mistake maybe you don't know what that feels like but that's what humans do they make mistakes we all make mistakes it's what makes us human. Point number nine. So if I'm understanding Halsey correctly, part of her search for children to abduct into a Spartan program was also her searching for kids whose genetics were similar to the human DNA she found in these ruins, right? Why then were the rest of Silver Team not able to activate the lesser keystone when they touched it in season one? Are their genetics similar but not as close as John's or something? Point number 10. Why does Kai just randomly stand in front of and stare at where her armor should be? Seems a bit random to me. Point number 11. So thanks to Parangoski, everyone thinks children Chief died on reach, so him showing up in his armor will reveal her to be the liar she is and give weight behind Agassin's claims that she was part of sacrificing Reach. But then, what about all the marines that have thus far been sent to apprehend Chief? What have they been told about him having supposedly died on Reach but has now shown up alive and well? Were they told the same thing Akerson tried to put into Kai's head that Chief was now working with the Covenant due to interacting with McKee? Point number 12, I've been wondering for most of this season whether Quan might actually be like John and McKee and be a blessed one herself and seeing her interacting with and figuring out all this foreigner stuff is just making me think that's true more and more. What do you guys think? Point number 13, Quan figuring out they needed to reposition the stars to where they would have been on the map millions of years ago is similar to Cortana in the novel The Fall of Reach, analyzing the data acquired from the foreign artifact on Sigma Octanus 4 and figuring out the location of Installation 04 by repositioning stars to where they would have been a few thousand years ago. Also in regards to figuring out how to unlock the foreigner door by using their understanding of mathematics, linguistics, space and time, this really reminds me of the Stargate SG-1 episode Thor's Chariot, where there is a test involving runes, shapes and pictographs which are meant to only be solvable by a civilization that's become advanced enough to know what the number pi is. Point number 14, oh hells yes, the classic hard light bridge and the classic foreigner door. I love it. I've seen people mistakenly think the symbol in the middle of the door is that of a guardian though that we see in Hill of Five, but while similar, the two symbols are different, with the lines in the lower half of the symbols not matching up. The top symbol, though, we have definitely seen before, all the way back in Halo Combat Evolved in the mission 343 Guilty Spark. You know, the mission where you encountered the Flood for the first time. Point number 15. This is no mine. It's a tomb. Point number 16. It's a laboratory. Excuse me, but if watching Dexter growing up taught me anything, it's how to pronounce laboratory properly. <laughs> Sorry. Point number 17, oh wow, the show actually shows us a foreigner, a dead one but still, gives me the same vibes as seeing the dead space jockey in the first Alien movie, I wonder how and why they died, starvation maybe, and why were they locked in the laboratory? It also makes me wonder how different the Halo rings are in this timeline compared to the blue timeline, so far I've only ever heard of there being one ring, more than that existing hasn't been revealed yet, and I wonder if it ever will. And will the show have it that the Halo has been activated before to wipe out the Flood, because if it has, then this foreigner body shouldn't exist, it should have been disintegrated by the Halo, that is, if the Halo functions the same way in this timeline as it does in the blue timeline. Point number 18, so why did the place start shaking, the door start closing and the bridge deactivate? Delayed quarantine lockdown procedure or something? Though that doesn't explain why the lights then turned on to reveal the city the foreigners have for some reason built underground. Point number 19, oh Halsey is seriously just seeing what she wants to see that is almost certainly the spread of the flood across the galaxy infecting world after world. And the silver debrief on the Halo Waypoint website strongly indicates this is in fact connected to the flood as well in its core connections section. Let us speak of old things, hidden terrible things from a time long forgotten. From one of the Magellanic clouds of stars beyond the reaches of our galaxy, a fleet of ancient starships arrived at our cosmic border. These vessels were of unknown design and on an automated trajectory, carrying neither passengers nor crew, but a curious cargo, millions of glassy cylinders containing a fine, 
desiccated powder. Wreckage of these mysterious ships were discovered by the ancestors on worlds both inhabited and empty. Upon examination, they were found to contain shorter chain molecules, simple and inert, organic, yet seemingly neither alive nor capable of life. Experiments on animals demonstrated desirable psychotropic effects, improving their domestic behaviour, and over several centuries this powder was used without ill consequences. But in time, the long-term effects of this powder became known. A peculiar growth began to emerge, initially thought of as a natural mutation, until these animals, natural herbivores, began consuming these growths, and eventually the animals themselves. This set off some sort of biological timer, a signal for expansion, as these growths soon began to manifest in the ancient human ancestors. No, that as energetic and tenacious as life is, it has an antithesis just as powerful. It is that thing that we must obliterate. Point number 20, with the revelation that this is most likely a foreigner lab where they were testing on the flood, why then has this vision of the mother been leading Quan to its location? Is it benevolent, leading Quan there so she can learn about the flood and warn others, or is it malevolent, leading her there to unintentionally release the flood? Is the mother a foreigner Gesh, or is she a flood psychic message from a grave mind on the ring, or perhaps even the show's version of the primordial? Point number 21, so seeing McKee still having the marks on her back from when she was attacked as a child, Child, most definitely means she isn't some form of clone. I doubt we're ever going to get an answer to the mystery of how she survived being shot, though as I said before, we don't really need an answer since people get shot and survive all the time. Point number 22, Talia wondering if John actually made the coin Halsey had in Flip come up heads is just like in the novel The Fall of Reach, when Halsey herself wonders the exact same thing. Point number 23, uh-uh, nope, I don't like that hiss and the dust that came out of that thing when Miranda opened it, Gives me Wickus opening the prawn black goo fuel container in District 9 vibes. Point number 24, is it section 70 where Halsey and Miranda are and that's why Halsey disappears, she's run off so she doesn't get captured? Or could section 70 be where Quan ran off to and Halsey's gone to find her? Point number 25, I called it that Kai would join her Spartan 3s in space jumping into the Covenant fleet. Now I'm wondering though, who might be the one to make the great sacrifice, Kai or Talia? Maybe Kai, a Spartan 2, will throw Talia, a Spartan 3, out of a ship before destroying it, just like how George, a Spartan 2, threw Noble 6, a Spartan 3, out of the Ardent Prayer before destroying it. And what if they do blow up a ship, since Ackerson discovered if they plug in the spike, it will essentially self-destruct in a blast that will encompass everything within a million miles, including the Halo. The Halo will most likely protect itself, but I wonder in what way. Will it just use hard light shields, or could it possibly slit space jump? After all, a major part of the first Halo game was that no one knew where the Halo was besides those already on the Halo, so a rescue couldn't be launched for the crew of the Pillar of Autumn. But in this timeline, humanity knows where the Halo is. A desperate struggle to survive and escape the ring isn't possible unless the ring slit space jumps to an unknown location, making it impossible for reinforcements or a rescue party to be sent to the ring and to Master Chief. To round all this off, my most disliked part of the episode goes to how Parangoski treats the Spartan 3s and Akerson. Just like how they ramped up the snackiness of Halsey this season, they really ramped up the ruthless heartlessness of Parangoski. And my most liked part of the episode goes to Briggs getting what she deserves. Love it. Whoever controls Halo controls the fate of the universe. Point number one, Jesus Christ, what kind of scientist is Miranda? Looking at ancient alien spores that have just woken up whilst wearing zero protective gear. Look at how the scientists handle the MEV-1 in the movie Contagion. Look at how Dr. Jenner handles the zombie virus in The Walking Dead. Look at how Professor Pertwee handles examining an infected corpse in The Last of Us. All of them are wearing protective gear, whereas Miranda just isn't. Plus, anyone can come and go from the examination room as they please, and there's no decontamination airlock. It's no surprise whatsoever that the flood managed to spread so easily and as fast as it did throughout this episode. Point number two, pretty dumb of Parangoski to talk to Chief over loudspeaker. I mean, did she really expect him to just roll over and play along? Of course he was going to be antagonistic towards her and make her look bad in front of everyone else in the room. Point number three, I wonder if this is what infection forms are going to look like in this timeline or if this is just what they look like as babies and they will eventually grow into the full size ones we're used to seeing in the games. Point number four, we finally see grunts this season and there's only two and they're in shadow. I will say this season has been a step down in showing us the Covenant races, whereas last season we saw the Hierarchs, many grunts, jackals, elites and brutes, and even a brief glimpse of a hunter. 
This season, we've only seen primarily elites and jackals, one brute, and now two grunts. Point number five, what a genius idea from the crew of the Himalaya to fly directly under the assault carrier, making themselves an easy target for its glassing beam. Point number six, God, yes, Kai using a carbine and Talia jewel wielding needlers Halo 2 style. You absolutely love to see it. Point number seven, I find it so creepy, this take on the flood, that those infected just freeze in place as the virus takes over their body. And I've also seen, as I'm I'm sure you all have too, people complaining that this show has just made the flood into basic boring zombies or they're just ripping off The Last of Us or some other nonsense. Ignoring the fact that we've already seen this kind of zombification in the blue timeline before in the motion comic of the short story The Mona Lisa from Halo Evolutions, we explicitly see those infected eventually become more like the combat forms we see in the games by sprouting extra appendages. Point number eight, where are the other Covenant ships that were chasing after McKee and the Arbiter? Did they just give up after the escape pod launched and return to the fight with the UNSC ships? Point number nine, Cortana transferring herself into Chief's suit is actually a new concept for both timelines. In the blue timeline, she doesn't inhabit Chief's suit, but is stored in the data chip plugged into his helmet. She just uses his suit as a conduit to transfer herself to external systems. Now it appears the only way Chief can lose Cortana is if she transfers herself to an external system and he doesn't retrieve her, like at the end of Halo 2, or if Chief once again loses access to his suit while she's inside of it. Point number 10. It's the perfect fusion of artificial intelligence and organic life. Does that mean every living thing on the ring is pseudo-biological, like how the Hurugok, the engineers, are artificially created biological life forms? Point number 11, once again another reference to the Halo Infinite teaser trailer released in 2018. This show really likes referencing that shot from the teaser trailer, doesn't it? Point number 12, John, why are we here? It's one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? Why are we here? Point number 13, has Kai seriously just been standing on the bridge of this Covenant ship this whole time watching the space battle play out and deciding to do absolutely nothing until now? I mean, it's been 10 whole minutes since we last saw her. Does that time accurately translate into the show? Why did she just wait so long before seeing if she could fly the ship? Point number 14, god damn, everyone on Onyx is exceptionally oblivious to everyone else around them to the point that it took until those infected were ready to attack before anyone even noticed there was something wrong with them. Point number 15, I'm pretty sure there's no way Parangoski survives this, but the silver debrief for this episode on the Halo Waypoint website is vague on whether she lives or dies, just saying, before departing, she witnesses Parangoski being held down by the infected. I've seen people speculating as well that Parangoski might stand in for blue timeline keys in being the basis for a proto grave mind, and she'll have to be properly killed before she can divulge any vital information about humanity and Earth to the flood. Point number 16, I've also seen a lot of speculation on the mother appearing to Quan and the conversation they have with each other. One theory is that she is a vision from a grave mind or the primordial as she says. Says, I knew you'd find me. We knew you would deliver us. She led Quan to where the specimen container was so that the flood would be released and that she also has some control over the flood since she stops them from attacking Quan. She also says, It is the cohesion, the meaning, the final equilibrium. Cohesion and equilibrium accurately describes the flood with their definitions, the action or fact of forming a united whole, and a state in which opposing forces or influences are balanced. If the flood infects everything, they will be a united, balanced whole. But describing the flood as being the meaning is very interesting. Looking at synonyms and similar words for meaning from merriamwebster.com, we see words such as purpose, intention, ambition, dream, hope, words with too positive a connotation to apply to the flood. However, you then have words such as thing, end, scheme, more negative words that would be used by someone who is a part of the flood but is not an ally of the flood. And the silver debrief confirms this in a description of the conversation between Quan and the mother. Quan asks who she is and the mother reveals that she was like Quan, a protector, a very long time ago but she was consumed by the parasite within which her consciousness lives on. And this just leaves us with so many questions. What exactly is a protector? How is Quan descended from them? What connection did the living mother have with them? Why is this dead protector appearing to Quan in the form of the mother, considering the living version of the mother didn't interact with Quan, but with Chief? Was the living mother and those who followed her and stayed behind with her on Sanctuary actually real or just a vision appearing to everyone? How is this dead protector able to exert some control over the flood? My theories range from the dead protector being a precursor who didn't want the flood to spread throughout the galaxy. This would explain why it both refers to itself as the flood, we knew you would deliver us, 
but also as being separate from the Flood, it knows you, Quan, since if you've read the Foreigner trilogy, you know that Precursors and the Flood are one and the same. Or they could instead be an ancient human who existed at the same time as the Foreigners and the Flood, and so is actually a direct ancestor of Quan's from around 100,000 years ago, and has been a part of the Flood ever since. Or they could be a Foreigner in a similar role to Life Workers in that they dealt with protecting life, more specifically, in this case, the life of planets themselves, rather than the species which live on them, which would fall under the duties of the life workers. And via a foreigner Gesh and through psychic visions, this role of protector has been transferred from foreigners to humans and then passed down for thousands of years. What are your theories on the mother, the role of protector, and how this all connects to the flood? Let me know in the comments. Point number 17, it's a neat touch. The splash of plasma from the energy source burns a mark into Chief's armor that looks similar to the damage he has on it in Halo 3. It isn't the exact same though, as it is on the wrong side. Point number 18, I guess the Arbiter threw away his sword just like this Elite also did on Sanctuary out of honour since Chief wasn't holding a weapon, but then gets so mad Chief isn't dead and won't stop fighting, he throws honour out of the window and starts using his sword again. Point number 19, I am so glad they didn't forget that they introduced Chief having the grapple shot at the start of the season and we get to actually see him use it in his fight against the Arbiter, sort of Halo Infinite style, but rather than pulling himself towards the Arbiter, he pulls the Arbiter towards him. Point number 20, so from what I've been able to gather by going frame by frame, Chief seems to have himself a The Last Jedi disappearing knife situation happen to him here. At first it appears after Gatanai cuts the grapple shot, Chief grabs his knife, but he actually doesn't. You can still see it holstered when Chief punches Gatanai in the throat. But then it appears when they both start rolling around on the ground, Chief's knife just vanishes without him ever pulling it out. Strange. Point number 21, I love the contrast here with the Arbiter and characters like Lewis and Riz. They learned how to continue on living when they could no longer fight, but for the Arbiter, being a soldier and fighting was all he had, and so now, as he sees it, his life is no longer worth living, as he could no longer fight and not be a soldier. Point number 22, you better damn hope you don't have any infection forms on that ship. Like that one that crawled out of Janine's mouth and then seemingly vanished. Point number 23, oh yeah, your mum's safe in cryo, but what are you going to do now, Miranda? Hope the Flood won't find a way to break through the glass while you wait for rescue, slowly dying of starvation and thirst. Point number 24, we see Kai floating in space. Is she alive or dead? Well, the silver debrief says, Taking the Corvette's controls, Kai pilots the Covenant ship on a collision course, sacrificing herself. So make of that what you will. Point number 25, I love how at the end of the first episode we see Vargatanai and his fleet ascending through clouds to take water reach, and here at the end of this episode we see Chief and the human fleet descending through clouds to bring war to the Halo, just like McKee says, Wherever you go, war will follow. Point number 26, so it turns out throughout this episode Chief has been talking to a monitor. The silver debrief doesn't name the monitor, but it does reveal in its core connections section, at the end of the episode we learned that the Master Chief was conversing with an alien entity on the Halo ring, the monitor. This being previously appeared as the Wisp of the Well back in Season 1 when Quan underwent her strange vision quest with the Mist People on Madrigal. Yes, you read and heard that right. This monitor is the same one Quan saw in the Well on Madrigal in her vision quest in Season 1. Considering the monitor echoes Quan's description of the monster from the end of Episode 1, It's been here all that time, waiting to meet you in the dark. It's been down there all this time, waiting to meet you. In the dark. The monitor is most likely referring to the flood, but specifically what aspect of the flood? A grave mind, the primordial, or just the flood in general? Considering why would there be a grave mind on the ring? The only reason there was one on installation 05 in Halo 2 was because of a prior outbreak. Could that be the case on this ring as well? Or is it possible that just like how the Primordial was held captive within a time-locked Precursor Stasis capsule whilst still being able to converse with those outside of its prison, that there could be an imprisoned grave mind on the ring that was being tested on by the foreigners? Point number 27, how long has it actually been since Chief followed McKee into the structure considering Chief's armor has changed between then and this conversation with the Monitor? His knife has reappeared, the burn marks from the plasma that splashed onto his chest have disappeared, and the crack on one side of his visor has been replaced with a hole on the other side through which you can see his face. Plus it also appears his armor is either spattered with blood or possibly flood gloop. 
To round all this off, my most disliked part of the episode goes to how completely and utterly oblivious everyone is in the Onyx base that some people are looking and acting very weird. And my most liked part of the episode goes to how they managed to make the flood even more creepier than they already were by introducing the whole freezing thing and baby infection forms crawling out of their mouths. Thank you all so much for tuning into the Triple S Variety channel, and I really do mean thank you. Thank you for choosing to watch my videos, to leave comments, and to subscribe. It's really amazing to know that there are people who do actually enjoy watching my videos and enjoy listening to me speak. Even though Halo Season 2 has ended, I do hope you can stick around and check out my future videos, whether that be me playing video games, opening Yu-Gi-Oh cards, talking about other TV shows and movies, I know I will definitely be covering Fallout Season 1 and House of the Dragon Season 2, or just random videos on random topics I randomly decide to talk about. Before you go, why not leave a comment below pointing out anything I missed but you noticed in this episode? I would love to hear from you all. I've been Triple S, you've all been amazing, and I shall see you all in the next video.